Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for the Science Sunday Talk. My name is Amanda Robinson, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Political Science here, and I'm also the interim director of the Decision Sciences Collaborative, which is the host for today's talk. As most of you will know, Science Sundays is a free lecture series open to the public where scientists from OSU and beyond share their research with members of the Columbus community. The series is supported by eight research centers on campus, including the Decision Sciences Collaborative. Um, the Collaborative is an interdisciplinary research center that has over 100 faculty members and graduate students all working on um, processes of decision making and understanding how we think about uh, the decisions that we make every day. We try to develop basic theory in decision making, but also to use it to help people improve their decisions in a variety of contexts, from how to doctors talk to their patients to how people make decisions in the grocery store. Our speaker today, Dr. Rebecca Rizek, and the research she's gonna share with us provides a great example of the kind of scholarship that the, collaborated, the, the collaborative supports. Dr. Rizek received her PhD in marketing from the University of Texas at Austin in 2006. She joined OSU in 2009, and she's currently an associate professor of marketing in the Fisher College of Business. As you'll learn in a minute, Dr. Rizek's research focuses on consumer behavior, uh, with a particular focus on consumer lay theories, social influence, and self-perceptions. She pursues these theoretical interests in the context of food and health decisions, sustainability, and ethical decision-making. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rizek. Good luck. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for spending part of your Sunday here with me. I'm glad it's not a snowy Sunday. I'm sure everybody else is, too. Um, I'm excited to have a chance to share with you some of my research. And you can see from the title up here, I'm going to be talking about something that I call the healthy equals expensive intuition. So this is the consumer belief that healthy diets make empty wallets. And we're going to talk about why consumers might believe that and the fact that it doesn't necessarily matter whether this is objectively true. It's still going to influence how people make decisions. But before I get into that, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit more about my background. So I am an associate professor of marketing at Fisher College of Business, and because I'm a marketing professor, I'm going to tell you about my background using brand logos. So I did get my PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, so you should all recognize that's a Longhorn if anybody doesn't know. Uh, on graduation, I joined the faculty at the University of South Carolina, so for anyone who doesn't know, that is the Gamecock. And then I was fortunate enough in 2000 time, 2009 to get an opportunity to join The Ohio State University. And this was a great opportunity for me both professionally because this is a great institution with wonderful students, resources, and colleagues, but also a great opportunity for me personally because I am originally from Cincinnati. And so I, some laughter, if you've been to Cincinnati, you know Cincinnati Chili is a very important part of your Cincinnati identity. And you're either a Skyline fan or a Gold Star fan and I am a Skyline fan. And if you don't know Cincinnati chili, it's chili served over spaghetti and topped with cheese, and you should try it, even though it sounds weird. It's really good. In terms of what I do here at OSU, the classes I teach, I teach consumer behavior at all levels that we teach at Fisher, so undergrads, MBAs, and PhD students, and I also teach principles of marketing. That's the first marketing class that our undergrads take. And I actually teach to an audience of about 250 students, so this is not atypical from a normal teaching day for me to speak to an audience of this size. Uh, my research is in consumer psychology. So that means that I did about half of my coursework during my PhD in the psych department and the remainder in the business school in marketing with a little bit of econ thrown in as well. And my particular areas of interest are not necessarily just about helping businesses sell one more unit of product. I'm actually very interested in consumer well-being and very interested in understanding how can we use an understanding of consumer psychology to help consumers make better choices. And if you've been to other Science Sunday talks in the past, you may have seen some hard scientists speak. I am a social scientist. So what that means is my lab looks very different from the type of lab that you might see from a hard scientist. So my lab is actually over in the business school, and my main research method is to run experiments with volunteer student participants. So that means if you go to a chemistry lab, you'll see test tubes, you'll see beakers. If you go to a biology lab, you might see test subjects in cages. Well, my test subjects look like this, so we don't keep them in cages. They're volunteer undergraduate students who are very grateful they come in to participate in our studies, usually in exchange for extra credit. And what they're doing is our lab is basically a room 
room with computer stations with dividers so participants can't see what the others are doing. And what's happening is we're exposing them to some type of consumer stimulus. It might be a simulated store or a new product or an advertisement. And we're manipulating something about that stimulus. So we have two different versions. We're manipulating an independent variable to see if changing that independent variable has an effect on the dependent variable. And you'll see examples of that in the research I'm going to be talking about today, but the dependent variable would be something like intention to purchase or product liking. And one of the areas that I do this research in is understanding how consumers make decisions about food. And this is a question that I've been interested in really since grad school, thinking about we do have an obesity epidemic in this country. Why do people not choose healthier foods? What are some answers that, as a consumer psychologist, how can I contribute to this conversation of understanding what are the barriers to healthy eating? And there are a lot of answers to this question, but one answer that I'm gonna to propose to you today is consumer lay theories about food act as a barrier often that stops us from choosing healthy foods. So to explain what I mean by that, I need to explain what a lay theory is. And to do that, we have to talk about a distinction between scientific theories and lay theories. So up here you see a chemist in his lab. That's actually my husband in his chemistry lab over at, at Denison, so he's not at Ohio State, but there he is doing research in his lab. And when he uses a scientific theory, he's using it to try to explain the natural world. And the theories that he uses help him make predictions, help him understand the world so that he knows if I combine these two particular solutions, I'm gonna get this chemical reaction. Well, it turns out that all of us, as non-scientists, everyday people also have theories about the way the world works. Unlike for scientists who are trying to use these prediction or use these theories to make predictions to try to understand fundamental truth, lay theories are people's everyday theories they use to understand and respond to all aspects of their world. They don't have to necessarily be true. There's people's lay or naive or um, intuitive understandings of the world. And they're actually very powerful in how they shape our decision making. So to give you guys some examples of what I'm talking about, in psychology we often talk about lay theories about how people understand their social world. So something like the early bird gets the worm. That's a lay theory. That's a theory that you could have as a person about how the world works that tells you uh, you can use it to understand and make predictions. If I work hard, then I'll get rewards. That doesn't have to be how you understand the world, but this is a lay theory that basically encapsulates the Protestant work ethic view of the world. Many people have this view. Another example of a lay theory, these often look like proverbs, so you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This is essentially a lay theory of the self, saying that the self is a fixed entity that doesn't change. We can contrast that with something like, it's never too late to turn over a new leaf, saying the self is not fixed, the self can change over time. And if you think about these two, they are actually, they're conflicting lay theories, right? They say fundamentally different things about the self. And that's because going back to this point, unlike scientific theories, lay theories don't have to be objective or testable or true. They're the understanding that we develop as people about how the world works that regardless of whether they're true or not, shape how we make decisions. And if we think about these two opposing lay theories in psychology, we call this a fixed view of the self versus an incremental view of the self. If you have a fixed view of the self, that's going to affect how you respond to your social world. If you think, I can't change, you're not, for example, likely to pick up new hobbies. You may not invest much time in New Year's resolutions because you don't see yourself as someone who can change. If you're someone who has an incremental view of the world and you think the self can change, you're far more likely to pick up new hobbies, invest in new relationships, uh, try New Year's resolutions. So that's just showing how pervasive these lay theories can be in all aspects of how we interact with the world. As a consumer psychologist, though, I'm interested in people's understanding of a marketplace. So imagine yourself going to the grocery store to buy a nice bottle of wine. So you've got a birthday celebration or an anniversary celebration, you wanna buy something that's good quality. But if you're like me, I actually don't know a lot about wine, so I'm faced with this display, and I think, okay, how am I gonna make this decision? I will often look at the price. And I look at price because I have a, a lay theory that price and quality are correlated, meaning that higher priced wines are generally better. And while that may be true a lot of the time, that's not always true. But what using that lay theory does for me, it lets me make a quick, easy decision. I get out of that store, I feel good, okay, I probably got a good quality wine. That's not the only way to make that decision, though. We could spend a lot more time and effort making that decision. We could go and read Wine Spectator. We could pull out our smartphone, get out Pinterest, look for examples of good wines. I found this on Pinterest. If anyone's interested, we've got a bunch of wines that are, oh, you can't quite see the label. They're all under $15 and get a 90-plus rating. So 
the idea of the price quality relationship that high price always means high quality, definitely not true, but it's functional for consumers to use it. So just like those other lay theories I described were functional for people to navigate their social world, our scientific theories are functional for scientists to make predictions, consumer lay theories are functional to get us through the store often. So I like this picture because I think no one actually looks like this when they go through the grocery store. <laughs> this is a stock photo that I got online. I have two young kids. I definitely do not look that relaxed in the grocery store. I want to get in, get out, make quick, easy decisions, get on with my life. And in behavioral science, we talk about the fact that people are cognitive misers. And what that means is we have a limited amount of cognitive resources, and we want to conserve those resources. We want to save them for things that actually matter. And when we think about consumer decisions, there is a continuum of effort in terms of how much effort we're willing to put into consumer decisions based on how motivated we are. And obviously there are some consumer decisions that we put a lot of effort into, things like buying a house, buying a car. That's when we're gonna do more than just even a quick smartphone search or look at Pinterest. We might spend a lot of time doing a lot of research before we make those types of decisions. Somewhere between that and grocery store decisions, maybe things like buying an iPhone, buying a new appliance, we're putting in some effort. But the vast majority of our decisions as consumers fall all over here on the left, things like toilet paper, yogurt, uh, laundry detergent, we're not willing to put a lot of time and effort into those decisions. And if you think about the last 10 decisions you made as a consumer, and I'll give you a chance to actually think about them. So think about the last 10 things you bought. I'm guessing for almost everybody, the vast majority of those fall on this far end of the continuum. Most of us probably didn't buy a house in the last few minutes or a few hours or even the last few days. And as consumers, we go throughout our lives, and most of them are these low effort decisions. So what we're trying to do in low effort decisions, we want to spend as little effort as possible. Because if we didn't, if we stopped and thought about every single decision we made when we went to the grocery store, it would take us five to six hours to shop. And we just can't afford to do that. So we talk about, in consumer behavior, the fact that people use uh, rules of thumb or heuristics as choice strategies to get out of the store faster. Brand loyalty is actually a shortcut to help you get out of the store faster. Because if you know I always buy Jif because I love Jif peanut butter, then guess what? You can spend about one second in the peanut butter aisle because you just put it in your cart. Habit is a related simplifying strategy. The only difference is it's saying I always buy Jif because that's what I buy rather than I always buy GIF because I'm absolutely convinced that it's the best. There can be other choice strategies like buy the one the kids ask for, buy the one that your spouse wants you to buy, but we have all sorts of rules of thumb that we use to get us out of the store faster. And intuitions or lay theories serve the same purpose. They help us make quick, easy evaluations of stimuli. And I'm gonna be interested in food stimuli and what I'm talking to you about today. So we'll give you guys a, a question. I'm gonna show you two granolas and I'm gonna ask you which granola tastes better? So we've got two granolas here. We've got granola and low-fat granola. Raise your hand if you think the low-fat granola tastes better. So, okay, there are a few brave souls in the back who are saying, I think it tastes better. Raise your hand if you think the granola tastes better. Yeah, and most people say that. So you guys do what most of the subjects in my experiments do. But if you stop and think for a second, what are you basing that on? All I've given you are some kind of generic looking pictures of granola and just telling you one granola is regular granola, one granola is low fat granola, but most people are willing to pretty confidently say, oh yeah, that granola tastes a lot better. What you're basing that on is a lay theory, is a belief that unhealthy foods taste better. And this is some work that I published when I had a different last name right out of grad school, but this is kind of what sparked my interest in understanding the consumer intuitions that shape how we make decisions about food. And what I just asked you to do was basically to use your lay theory to make an inference of a missing attribute. Because here, you know something about the health information of these granolas, but you have no idea how they taste. And what you're doing is you're falling back on this learned lay theory to make an inference of the taste. And I want to share with you guys another experiment from this paper before we get into talking about health and price. And as a consumer researcher, I told you I do a lot of studies in the lab with undergraduate students. We also do field studies. And when you hear the word field study, you might think of an anthropologist who when they go out into the field, they're immersing themselves into another culture, maybe traveling to another country, an exotic location. As a consumer researcher, when I go out into the field, 
It's anywhere people are making consumption decisions. So the field for me is a store, is your home, right? It's anywhere where you're actually interacting with consumer products. So this is a field study we actually did at a party. And we told people who were attending the party that we knew someone who was interested in opening an Indian restaurant, and they wanted an American audience's perception of the dishes they were gonna serve there. And so we had people go one by one into a separate room to do a tasting task for the supposed owner of this restaurant. And what we did is there were three different dishes, and one was the target dish, and that was mango lassi. You have a picture of a mango lassi here. And you might have had these at an Indian restaurant. They are basically a mango milkshake, but it's kind of ambiguous how healthy they are. And what we did is a very simple manipulation. We, on the sheet where they said how much they liked each one, they got to read the sheet before they tasted it. We said, this is a relatively healthy snack from India, or this is a relatively unhealthy snack from India. That's all we manipulated. We just said it's healthy or it's unhealthy. Everybody drank the exact same drink. So that's really important. Doesn't, nothing manipulated about the drink. And then we just asked people to rate, how much did you enjoy the taste of this mango milkshake? And these are the results. This is when they thought it was healthy. This was on a seven point scale. So they thought it tasted okay, right? That's a little bit below the midpoint of the scale. It's fine, it's not that great. But let me show you the results of the people who read that it was a relatively unhealthy snack. They thought it tasted pretty darn good. So this is surprising to a lot of people when they see this because we don't like to think that our taste perceptions are that subjective. They actually are. So this shows us that our intuitions are influencing not just our best guesses about you know, looking at the granola without tasting it, but it's also affecting our actual judgments about the taste itself. And I love this cartoon because they, they must have read my study before they made this cartoon. Is we have a guy who's eating some very high fat ice cream. He says, it doesn't taste as good now that it's not a sin because he just read this headline, low fat diet benefits in doubt. So basically, hey, ice cream's not that bad for you. Ugh, it doesn't taste as good then. And this is a funny cartoon, but if we think about the implications for consumers, what this tells us is that if people have a goal to be healthy, they are going to assume that they have to eat things that don't taste good. And we know from lots of research on goal pursuit, it's actually really hard to maintain sustained goal pursuit. And we can think about New Year's resolutions. Why do we fall off the wagon when we have a New Year's resolution to eat healthy? Well, this is one of the reasons why. It's because we have this implicit, almost non-conscious belief that in order to eat something healthy, we have to sacrifice taste. And what was really neat for me about doing this research is we also asked people just tell me explicitly, do you believe that unhealthy foods inherently don't taste good? And it turns out a lot of people won't tell me that. They say, no, that's not true at all. I completely disagree. But then when you get those same people into a study where they're actually making inferences about food or tasting food, they act as if that's what they believe. So this seems to be something that people either don't know that they believe or aren't willing to admit that they believe, but it still impacts how they make choices. So if you think about what this means for helping people make better choices, it's, it's a little bit disturbing because it suggests people think the deck is stacked against them, that they can't, if they have a hedonic goal, a goal to enjoy what they're eating, that that inherently means they have to choose something unhealthy. And there's research in psychology looking at how do you overcome bias and looking at things like stereotype. But they suggest in this research that to overcome even implicit or non-conscious bias, the best thing to do is to expose yourself to counter stereotype examples. So I would suggest that if we want to get people over the hurdle of believing that unhealthy things are inherently not as tasty, the best thing to do is to expose ourselves and to make sure we think about examples of foods that are both healthy and tasty. So take a minute for yourself and think, can, do you know any examples of foods that are healthy and tasty? And really, when we stop and think, I think most of us, so can I see nodding if you can think of examples of foods that are healthy and tasty? Okay, so I do see nodding. Yes, they exist. But we tend to not think about them. We tend to think more about this inverse, this negative relationship. So if you don't want this to be you, make sure you think about those counter stereotypic exemplars, those counter stereotypic examples. That's the best way to combat a bias that you may not even know you have because it may be this implicit non-conscious bias. But that's really kind of just to whet your appetite to get into my main topic for today, which is about health and price. So now I'm going to show you some granolas and I'm going to ask you which granola is healthier? Is it the one that costs $5.95 or the one that costs $7.20? So 
Raise your hand if you think it's the one that costs $5.25. A few people, oh, a few people willing to say, we don't know the answer, because you're right, you have no idea from the information I've given you. But how many, just looking at it, your gut response says 720, raise your hand. Okay, so most of you guys, and that is what our gut response tends to say, because we're relying on this implicit lay theory that healthy products are more expensive. And that's what I wanna talk to you about for the rest of the time. This is some research that I just published last year in the Journal of Consumer Research. And the first thing we did when we started this project is I wanted to know, is this like the unhealthy equals tasty intuition that people don't even know that they have it, or will they admit it? And it turns out, People definitely are happy to tell you, oh yes, healthy products are really expensive. We did an online survey where we asked people, this is um, adult respondents in an online survey, how much do you agree with these three statements about the relationship between health and taste? So eating a healthy diet costs more than eating an unhealthy diet. Healthier foods are generally more expensive than unhealthier foods. And unhealthy foods are often quite inexpensive compared to healthy foods. This is a one to seven scale. So that mean of 5.2, that tells you that on average, that's significantly different than the midpoint of the scale. So that tells you that on average, people are agreeing with this. They're saying, yeah, healthy foods are more expensive. Absolutely. But let me show you these pictures. There's a lot of evidence. This is just showing you some picture evidence. What can you get for $20? Well, you can get a meal at Burger King, or you can get all of these healthy foods from the supermarket. What can you get from KFC for $20? You can get an eight-piece chicken meal with all the sides, or you can get all of this healthy food for $20. Now, I realize there's a difference in the amount of effort here. One involves a lot more effort than the other, and there's a convenience factor that goes with the cheap, unhealthy food. But people often, when they think about, okay, what's healthy, um, what's expensive, they, don't, they, they neglect to think about all of the food at the supermarket that actually is both healthy and affordable. And there's actually some evidence from the USDA that eating a healthy diet does not cost any more necessarily than eating an unhealthy diet. But people still tend to really strongly believe that healthy equals expensive. So let's talk about why. So where lay theories come from, psychology research tells us they come from personal experiences and they come from environmental cues. So if there's all that healthy, affordable food in the grocery store, why don't our personal experiences teach us that healthy food is actually affordable? Well, one of the answers to that is that we are biased samplers of our own experiences. Memory is not a recording device. We can't remember every single thing that we've ever encountered. So when we think back on what does the relationship between health and price look like, we tend to rely on salient and easily retrievable information. What that means, salient is something that stands out, easily retrievable. This is often what's easily retrievable. What's accessible is something that we've encountered a lot. So let's think about the types of cues we might encounter a lot in our environment. So one thing we see a lot of is super, super cheap fast food, right? The fast food chains have been in a recent war to offer more and more unhealthy food for less and less money. We see a lot of that. We also might see things like this. If we're out and about, like at an amusement park, here you see the water and the salad are actually more expensive than the, the burger and fries and Coke. Something like that tends to be very salient, meaning it will stand out, be easy to recall in our memory. And there also are categories where the healthy option really is more expensive. So the USDA has recognized organic eggs, organic meat, they really are more expensive. And the consumer perception is that organic equals healthy. Whether organic actually eats healthy, if you talk to medical professionals, I think they will, uh, you'll get different answers, but many of them will say it doesn't necessarily matter. But again, we're in the domain of perception and lay theories, not necessarily the domain of reality. So if consumers think that organic is healthier and they see high prices on these particular organic foods, that starts to stand out. That's readily accessible or gluten-free products. And on this one, the jury is, is not out that Basically, gluten-free products are not any healthier for you unless you have celiac disease. But again, we're in the domain of consumer perceptions. Many consumers think gluten-free equals healthy. And gluten-free products are another category where absolutely they are more expensive than their conventional counterpart. Then we also see something else in stores quite a bit. And that is the super expensive trendy health ingredient. And there's a different super expensive trendy health ingredient, it seems like, every month. I picked on acai berries here, and this is something that would stand out and be really salient. If you go into a store and you see you know, a $6 chia acai berry bar that's calling itself a health warrior, that stands out. You're going, why is that thing $6? And it's really expensive. Hmm? 
sorry, there's a question? Oh, okay. Okay, got it, sorry. So we see all this stuff in the store, and we're not necessarily looking at things like this. This is something the USDA put together to illustrate that you really can get cheap, uh, healthy food. And the problem with this is, because we're making quick, easy decisions in stores, we're not doing this type of calculation ourselves, right? We're not stopping to think about, what this is showing you is how to get your daily fruit and vegetable requirements for $2.61 a day or less. But we are not doing these kinds of calculations ourselves, and quite frankly, a cheap can of pinto beans doesn't catch our eye in the same way as a super expensive, flashy, new, trendy, health ingredient, very expensive bar. So the information is just really not that salient in our environment. So we have this biased sampling of all the food and health prices we've encountered. And we also, quite frankly, we get biased messages from the media. If you Google healthy eating, you will get a ton of websites that look like this, healthy eating on a budget. I borrowed this from the Food Network, but what this is implying is that, guess what, healthy eating on a budget is really hard because you'll find tons and tons of tips on how to do it, which is basically saying, because it's really tough. This one is actually from an organization trying to encourage people to eat local. It says, maybe we should stop asking why real food is so expensive and start asking why processed food is so cheap. What they may not realize is very well-intentioned trying to get people to eat local, what they're actually doing with this messaging is reinforcing the idea that healthy food is super expensive, right? Which is not necessarily what we want consumers to think. And then we see messages in the media talking about whole paycheck, this Whole Foods is nickname, if you haven't heard that one before. We know Whole Foods is associated with health, but also associated with being really expensive. And then we also see talk in the media about food swamps is a new term that just recently came out, and food deserts. Food deserts are geographic areas that lack access to healthy, affordable food. Food swamps are areas, small geographic areas, that have an abundance of very cheap, very unhealthy food. And these are small geographic areas, but there's a lot of discussion about them and how to alleviate the concerns around them. But what it does is enforces in our mind this idea that healthy food is expensive and unhealthy food is cheap. So we see constant messaging, and honestly, marketers are to blame. So we picked on Burger King earlier, we can pick on Wendy's as well. We have lots of 99 cents, super unhealthy food, and we have gluten-free food, things like that, priced at very high prices. So we're constantly getting exposed to these messages. So where does the lay theory come from? It comes from this biased sampling of our past experiences. It does not come from an objective assessment of all the food products we've ever encountered. And it also comes from exposures to marketing messages and messages in the media that are consistent with this idea. But what's happening is we're extrapolating from specific instances we've encountered or specific product categories where a healthy option really is more expensive to a more general belief and what happens is it becomes a bias when we assume this is a more general belief that applies everywhere and we apply it to all of our decision making, then it can lead us astray. So I'm going to show you some examples of where it actually is leading consumers astray in some of my studies. Um, but one thing else I want to point out before we do that, I'm not saying that we always use this lay theory. So if you look at these two plates of food and you see they're equally priced, you're not going to go, now I don't know which one's healthier because they're the same price. We know that a burger and fries is less healthy than salmon and asparagus. Where this lay theory comes into play is when health information is missing or ambiguous. So we're not going to say, oh, the burger and fries are $12.99. That's the healthy option. No, that's not going to happen. We're not going to need to rely on price here to say the salmon's more expensive. Where it gets tricky is in situations like this. So you're dining in a restaurant. Maybe you know what the ingredients are in the two entrees, but you don't have the actual nutrition facts there. You're not maybe sure how it was prepared. Is it soaked in butter? Does it have a really rich cream sauce? And here is where you might find yourself relying on the intuition to think which one is healthier. And this is where, with the example like I gave you with the granola, where you might start to think, okay, the, the salmon, the one that's $12.99, that one must be the healthier option. And I'll show you some evidence of people making choices in my studies where that's exactly what they do. And it's actually probably often the case that we're in these situations where health information is ambiguous in some way, because we use lay theories from a theoretical perspective when information is missing or ambiguous. In most places where we shop, price is not missing, right? We have price as available information, but health is often missing, not necessarily because it's unavailable, but because people just don't use it. 
So you might know that because of the Affordable Care Act, all restaurants with more than 20 locations actually have to list the calories on the menu board. Most of them don't list it like that, where it's really big and obvious and easy to read. You, I guarantee you, you've been in restaurants where the calorie information is on the menu or on the menu board, and there's already research looking at the results of doing this, and the answer, somewhat depressingly, is people just really don't use this information. And if you have been to a restaurant that had the information, think about the number of times you actually used it and it affected your decision making. And even in the store, every single individually packaged item sold in the United States has to have that nutrition facts panel on it, on the back. And that's exactly where it stays for most people. When was the last time you were in the store trying to make a decision and you actually turn the nutrition facts panel around to read it? Now, if you're trying to pursue a specific diet, you might have but a lot of consumers don't take the time. They're not like that relaxed consumer in the grocery store. They're trying to make a quick, easy decision. They don't take the time to actually read the information. And ambiguity is also often a, a lot of ambiguity around what does healthy even mean. So if you watch the news, you see people talking about superfoods, the paleo diet, gluten-free, or should I be eating functional foods that are designed to actively manage some aspect of my health? A lot of consumers really aren't even sure what does healthy mean anymore. And this cartoon, I think, perfectly illustrates that. We have a woman saying, I'm trying to eat healthier, so I'm having a GMO-free, locally sourced, free-range, no antibiotics, sustainably farmed, all-natural burrito as big as my head. So she's gotten her messages mixed a little bit here. She's trying to be healthy by thinking about all these buzzwords that she's hearing, but probably she's consuming too many calories in that meal if that burrito is as big as her head, right? But it's easy as a consumer to kind of get lost in some of this, and that's often when we fall back on the intuition, when it's ambiguous what healthy really means. We fall back on price to help us as a cue, to help us make decisions. Because again, lay theories, while they may not always be true, they exist for a reason. They exist because they're functional. They help us when information's missing, when we're in a hurry, or when information is ambiguous and we're just not sure how to interpret it, we can fall back on a lay theory an easily understandable cue like price to help us make a judgment from there. So I'm going to tell you guys about as many of my experiments as I have time. This is a relatively simple study that we started with. We started this project. This is undergrads in our lab. And we wanted to know, will people not only infer price from health, will they also infer health from price? So what we did is we had consumers come in, and we told them they were going to try a new product that's a breakfast bar. And we only gave them one piece of information about this breakfast cracker. Actually, I'm sorry, it's breakfast cracker. And we gave them either health information, that it's healthy or unhealthy, or we gave them price information, that it's either high priced or low priced. Now, what they were actually eating was a Belvita breakfast cracker. Some of you may be familiar with it. We did check in the study. None of our participants knew what it was, so they believed us that it was a new product on the market, and we took off all packaging, so they just got the cracker itself. So they thought, this is a new product on the market, I'm gonna try it. And they either knew the typical price of the snack in front of you is about $2 in one condition, or 25 cents. So it's either pretty expensive or pretty cheap, or they saw no price information at all, and instead saw only health information. And the health information, they said, essentially it's been rated by an independent food lab as being pretty healthy, an A minus on an A through F scale, or a C minus. So I'm gonna show you the results, but I want you to keep in mind that once again, the actual cracker is not changing. Everybody's eating the exact same breakfast cracker, and we're gonna see big changes in how they respond to it because they are falling back on their lay theory, their intuition when they're making judgments. So this is on the left, participant sees only price information. What you're seeing is their ratings of how healthy this bar is after they've eaten it. And the blue bar is the expensive product when it's $2. The orange bar is when it's cheap. And you can see people think it is significantly healthier just when they think they'd have to pay more to get it. And obviously that can't be true. They're eating the same bar, but it fundamentally changes their interpretation of the bar they've just eaten. And then on this side, this is when people see only the healthiness information. And I find this result particularly interesting. The blue bar is when it's a healthy bar. The orange bar is when it's unhealthy. It actually tastes more expensive to them when they think it's healthy. Because they have eaten this bar, and they're saying, yes, absolutely, this is a more expensive bar. This is clearly a really high quality, more expensive bar, just because you told me it was healthy. In reality, they ate the exact same bar, but it's impacting their inferences, just like it did yours when I asked you which granola is healthier. 
So study one tells us the intuition is bi-directional and its influence persists after consumption. And that's important because sometimes when I talk to people about this, they say, fine, people may use their lay theories before they eat, but you know, once they eat, then they'll be able to taste the difference. They'll know that it's healthy or not. They'll know if it's expensive or not. And in reality, once again, our tastes are very subjective. So our, the intuition doesn't get corrected when we eat. The influence actually works the other way around. The intuition actually influences our judgments of what we taste are affected by the information that we get first and that our intuition then interprets. So our next step though is to see how do these inf inferences then translate into influence and consumer choice? Because that's what I care about. Is this going to be something that's going to potentially shift people away from choosing healthy foods? And this is a simple study that we did with adults online. And we told them you're going to uh, order lunch with one of your coworkers and your coworker is getting ready to be, she's, you're ordering lunch, she gets called into a meeting. She's asked you to order for her. You know that she likes chicken wraps. There are two chicken wraps on the menu. Which one are you going to order for her? So in one condition, that's all we told them. But in the other condition, we said, your coworker is actively trying to choose healthier foods lately. So this person has an active health goal. And we want to see if having an active health goal shifts around what people pick when we are manipulating the prices of the product. So we have two chicken wraps. One is a chicken balsamic wrap, the other is a roasted chicken wrap. It doesn't really matter what's in the wraps themselves because what we're doing when it says up here that the different prices are counterbalanced, we switch around which one is the cheap one and which one is the expensive one. So we don't want it to be driven by the specific things that are in each wrap. We want to see if we are manipulating the price, does the percentage of people that are choosing the healthy one, does that or sorry, choosing the expensive one, does that change when they have a health goal? Because they assume the expensive one is, is more healthy. So here are the results, and you're seeing it collapsed across whether it's roasted chicken wrap or balsamic wrap. And what we see, this is when there's no health goal. There is an overall preference for the expensive option, and this can probably be explained by price quality heuristics, that they're saying, okay, I'm buying this for my coworker, for my friend, I'm gonna get the more expensive one because it probably tastes a little bit better. So we're actually seeing operation of another lay theory there. But I wanna show you the results when they're told the coworker has a health goal. You can see that the choice of the expensive option, that's what's on the left, the choice of the expensive option goes way up. So what this is telling me is that people are assuming when there's a health goal, they have to spend more money to get something healthy. So we'll talk about why that's concerning in just a minute, but if you think about from a policy perspective or caring about consumer well-being, a lot of consumers who may be facing budget constraints, that may be enough right there to make them give up. If I have to spend more money to eat healthy, especially if we're talking about a lower income segment, I'm not even gonna bother. I'm just gonna give up. Why try? Because you have to spend more money to eat healthy. So I find that a little bit daunting of something that we have to face if we want to help consumers make better choices. But this is just one side of the picture. This is a health goal. What about if people have a budget goal? So I flip back and forth. I do some of my studies with undergraduates, some with adults online. This one's back in the lab where we asked undergraduates to make a series of grocery choices. So they had 26 choices between different types of groceries, so two uh, items in a category. And we told them they were buying these groceries, like what would you buy for a family of four? And the task was the same across our two conditions, but in one condition we said this family's on a tight budget. And the other condition, we didn't say anything about budget. There's no budget goal, there's no budget constraint. And our dependent variable here, so we're manipulating the goal, is there a budget goal or not? And we want to know there are 13 of these choices where there's a healthy item and an unhealthy item. We want to count the number of times they choose the healthy item. And our prediction is that when there's a budget goal, we're not going to give them any prices, by the way. They see no prices. And our prediction is when there's a budget goal, they're going to choose fewer of the healthy items. And we did this using perceived healthiness because lots of people have different ideas about what healthiness is. So we ended up with choices that look like this. These are our pretest results. And so we did a pretest. That's when, before you even run your experiment, you get a sample from the same population to help you design your stimuli to make sure they're doing what you think they're doing. Because we don't want it to be based on what do I think is healthy. We want it to be based on what our population thinks is healthy. So we ended up with choices like fresh salmon versus fish sticks. 94% of the people in the pretest said, yep, fresh salmon's healthier than fish sticks. 
uh, Kashi cereal versus Lucky Charms. 87% said the Kashi Goline cereal is healthier than Lucky Charms. Fewer than 1% thought Lucky Charms was healthier. No surprise. Um, and then we see ground turkey versus ground beef. And this one was actually just barely made it into our study because our cutoff that we set before we ran it, we had to have at least 75% of the pretest sample saying the healthy option is healthier and no more than 20% saying that they're equally healthy. So with ground turkey and ground beef, we did get 77% saying the ground turkey is healthier, 20% saying they're equally healthy, but it passed our threshold to go ahead and in include it in our study. And this only 13 of the pairs were healthy and unhealthy. The rest were filler tasks because we don't want people to guess our hypothesis. When I run a study, what I don't want, I don't want a subject to figure out what I'm doing and then tell me what they think that I want to hear or the opposite, try to sabotage my study and do the opposite of what they think I want to hear. These are called demand effects, and I don't want that to happen. So we often include fillers so people don't guess what it is I'm trying to test. So we have just you know, choosing between two brands of frozen lasagna, two brands of pizza, but the baked beans are actually serving an extra goal for me besides just being a filler. You'll notice this is a great value versus a name brand Progesso. This is a manipulation check. When we manipulate something, we want to make sure that we're actually successful. So I told these students they had a budget goal, but I need to know that they actually understood that, that they actually internalized it. So great value should be cheaper than Progresso, right? They don't see prices, but they know that great value is a generic, it's gonna be cheaper. So I should see more people choosing great value in the budget condition than in the control condition. And if I don't, my study's a failure because I didn't actually successfully give people a budget goal. And so these are the results of what we call a manipulation check. Yes, we did get 75% of people in the budget condition choosing great value versus only 41% in the control condition. So I see there are some younger people in the audience. If there's anybody out there interested in conducting behavioral research, I think it is just absolutely fascinating and fun to craft these experiments, to think about things like the manipulation check, think about controlling for all the other possible alternatives so that you can be sure at the end, if I've done it right, I know my manipulation was successful and I've manipulated only the cause I care about so that I can say any differences I see on the DV, on the dependent variable, are because of what I manipulated. And I think it's just really fun. I'm happy to talk to anybody who might be interested in a career in this type of work, happy to talk to you guys at the reception afterwards. But let me show the results. Okay, so these are the results. This is count data. It's looking at the number of healthy products out of 13 that go into the basket. And what you're seeing is that in the budget goal condition, we get just under six healthy items chosen out of 13. In the control, we get seven. And this is a statistically significant difference, but you might be thinking, is it a meaningful difference? And I think that it is, because if we're talking about for every 13 items that go into the cart, there's a potential for one fewer healthy item to go in the cart. And that accumulates over time, week after week after week. What that tells me is people that have a very constraining budget goal are going to choose overall fewer healthy items because they feel like they have to, to meet that budget goal. So if we think about these studies together, the intuition does affect choice. Consumers with a health goal default to choosing more expensive options. Consumers with a budget goal default to choosing less healthy options. And the implications for biased decision making, we see that consumers think they need to spend more money to get healthy. So if we have to spend more money, why bother trying? It's one of the things that concerns me. And consumers believe that to meet budget goals, they have to sacrifice health goals. And this is also concerning because budget goals often feel like a much more immediate constraint, right? So if you think about any time you're engaging in goal pursuit, we all have a hierarchy of different goals we're pursuing at any time. Hopefully you guys are here pursuing an enjoyment goal and it's actually being met, I hope so. Uh, but we all have these different goals. And if we feel like the budget goal is always pressing, always pressing, and we have to worry about that budget goal, then that health goal never gets to come up, never gets to be our primary goal. So if we have a budget constraint, we may feel like, well, we can never bother trying to be healthy. And again, this is all based on this lay theory that actually may not even be objectively true, right? If you look at that USDA information about how to get really affordable, healthy fruits and vegetables, it's actually quite doable. But our beliefs about the way the world works that may be erroneous may be what's stopping us. And I have one more study I'd like to share with you guys that shows how else the lay theory acts as a bias. And I think this one is particularly interesting. This is one that we did in our lab with undergraduate students. And we told them, you're going to the store to buy a trail mix. 
and you see four trail mixes. And they didn't see the red circles and the arrows, they just see four trail mixes. Our focal product is this perfect vision mix that's rich in DHA for eye health. And you can see it's $7.20 a pound. That $7.20 a pound is a 20% premium over the average price of the other three trail mixes. And what we manipulated in this study is we manipulated whether the perfect vision, so the trail mix that's making a health claim, the others are making claims about taste and texture. This one's making a health claim. Is it $7.20 a pound or is it $5.95, which is the average of the other three prices of the trail mix? And what we're interested in here, I'll show you our measures. We're interested in people's perceptions of how important it is that a healthy diet include DHA. What I want to know is seeing DHA for eye health, which by the way was an unfamiliar claim, for our participants, we pre-tested that to see, are they familiar with it? And they were not. On a one to seven scale, I think the mean was uh, 1.5, somewhere in that neighborhood. So they're really unfamiliar with this health claim. It is true, but they were unfamiliar with it. Just seeing it paired with a high price or an average price, does that change how important you think that that ingredient is as part of a healthy diet? And we took it one step further. We said, scientific studies suggest that DHA promotes eye health by preventing macular degeneration, which is age-related blindness. Keep in mind, these are undergraduates. They're 18 to 22. This is not a big concern for them, or at least it shouldn't be at this point in their life, given their age. But we said, how concerned are you about macular degeneration? And we said, this is age-related blindness. And we said, it's also available in a supplemental pill form. Are you interested in taking DHA supplements to help you with age-related blindness? And I'm going to show you the results. So what you're looking at, the blue bar is when the DHA trail mix was the average price. The orange bar is when it's a premium price. And that P equals 0.02, that tells you that's a statistically significant difference, that when that trail mix cost more, people thought that was a more important ingredient to have as part of a healthy diet. But I didn't show you one other part of the experiment. We also did the same thing with vitamin A. So we made vitamin A the ingredient rather than DHA. And in our pretest, participants said they were familiar with vitamin A as having eye health. And you'll see that NS stands for non-significant. There's not a significant difference for the familiar claim. So what this tells me is that only when health information is ambiguous, is unfamiliar, is unclear, that's when people are using the lay theory. So it's when we go into the store and we see acai berries uh, promising a health claim that we haven't seen before, that's when we're most likely to fall back on this uh, lay theory and think, just because I see it priced at $7, maybe, maybe I should be incorporating acai berries into my diet. We start to think I, I should do that. And this is the result for their concern about macular degeneration on the next slide. So here we see judgments of unfamiliar product claims being affected by the intuition. High price, they think it's more important to consume as part of a healthy diet. And again, very concerning, I think, from a policy perspective. Um, now concerns about macular degeneration. And you can't quite see at the bottom, it's normal vision, and on the right is vision with uh, macular degeneration. So this is, you know, it's a very, it is a concerning health ailment, but it's not a concern for 18 to 22 year olds. And what we see is that, yeah, they are significantly more concerned about it when the DHA is paired with a higher price. So that higher price not only makes them think DHA is a more important part of a diet, but they also think, gosh, since that was such an expensive product, that must be a major health issue that I should be concerned about now. And we don't see that for the familiar health claim, that there's no difference by price for the familiar health claim. So I found that result particularly uh, indicative of how powerful the lay theory can be. Because that tells me people are using the lay theory not just to make inferences about a single product, they're actually allowing the lay theory to influence something besides inter-product inferences, right? It's actually coloring their judgment about overall how important an ingredient is or overall how significant a health issue is. So our takeaway here, high price leads to greater importance of the broader health issue. So what does all this mean? Well, consumers commonly believe that healthy food is more expensive and vice versa, even though there's not necessarily a lot of objective evidence to support that. And again, that's because of that bias sampling of their personal experience and this exposure. In general, lay theories come from socio-cultural messages like what we hear in the mass media, and we hear a lot in the mass media supporting this idea that healthy foods are more expensive. And we also see from the studies that the healthy equals expensive intuition impacts inferences of missing attributes and therefore choice of food. And consumers rely on it particularly when information is missing 
or when health information is ambiguous. And honestly, that, that may be quite common in a lot of food choice situations, either because we're not processing carefully, systematically, we're in heuristic processing mode, which is what happens when we're in the store trying to make quick, easy decisions. That's very normal. Or when we're in this kind of new world of there's a new, cool, trendy health ingredient every other week. And then we also see the intuition can act as a bias in shaping how people process information about health and price. So I thought I would close with, okay, so what can you do with all this information? What this suggests for you as an individual consumer and what I try to do also as an individual consumer, slow down and think carefully before applying that general idea that healthy foods are more expensive as a general rule. I don't want you to take away from this that there are no healthy foods that are more expensive. There are some, and particularly if you do need to pursue a specific diet. So if someone does have celiacs and they do have to eat gluten-free products, yeah, their food is more expensive. So a lot of you know, diet-specific products can be more expensive, but those are specific instances. They don't apply to all foods. So don't apply this as a general rule. Um, but the reason we rely on lay theories is because they are functional. They're shortcuts, they're heuristics. They help us make quick, easy decisions. It's a lot easier to rely on a lay theory than to think carefully about every single decision that we make every time. So when should you stop and think and not rely on the lay theory? When you find yourself in a situation where health information is missing or is ambiguous, that's when you're most likely to fall prey to this. That's when you need to be careful to stop and think or if you're in a situation where you can make the health information not missing, can you turn the package around? Can you whip out your smartphone and do some quick Googling? As long as you make the information not missing when you get the information, then you're not gonna rely on the lay theory because we will use better information when we have it. So consumers are smart. If we have the more objective information, we will use it. It's just a natural tendency to fall back on this lay theory when we're in quick, easy, make a, make a fast decision, heuristic processing mode. So healthy expensive may be true in some categories, a few that it definitely is, organic eggs and poultry, gluten-free, but take the time to think about where it actually holds true before using it to make decisions. And I do, I believe, do we have some time for questions? We we have. And you're also welcome to email me. I put my email address up here on purpose. So if anyone wants to contact me or wants a copy of the paper, they're welcome to do so. so questions? Yes. Yeah, I 100% I agree with you that there's a, a hidden cost to healthy food, which is the effort cost. We're talking about effort to meal plan, effort to grocery shop, and what I'm actually doing here is I'm adding an additional type of effort. I'm actually saying you also need the mental effort to make sure you're not falling prey to this healthy equals expensive intuition. I don't know that I, I, I am proposing solutions. I am not a policymaker. I'm kind of glad that I'm not because I have a lot of problems here. I don't necessarily have a lot of solutions, but my hope is that by understanding better what the psychological barriers are, that we can develop better solutions. But I agree with you. There's absolutely a, an effort cost to healthy eating for sure. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to eat the question, or repeat the question. Um, so he was asking, obviously he was asking, what, what about the effort component of eating healthy, that, or the convenience component of eating unhealthy? Yes. So the question was, since the Affordable Care Act, where you have to post calorie information, have large chain restaurants seen a significant shift in ordering patterns? I do not know the answer to that. I do know from a consumer psychology perspective that they have looked at, did you pay attention to it? Did you use the information in your decision? And at least in academic studies, people are not using the information particularly. Yeah, so in terms of whether it's actually impacted fast food restaurants, I would wanna get some data before I answered that, but I would venture to say probably not significantly. Yeah.
Yes. No, it's a good question. So he asked, basically, would this hold across all populations? Does it hold across not just college students, but also older adults? And I will say some of my studies are with, um, when I do the online studies, the average age is usually about 35. So the range is typically 18 all the way up to 80 something, but it is a slightly more computer literate population because they are people who have signed up to be in online studies. So uh, probably about, I don't know, maybe 30% or so of the studies I've done in this project are with an adult population, and we do see the same results. But what I would like to do that I have not done is, because he, he was asking about the role of experience. With experience, would people learn to not apply this intuition? I have not done this with a population of, say, dietitians. It would be really interesting to see. And I heard a couple of people when I asked uh, which granola is more expensive, a couple of people said, you can't tell, which is actually the right answer, right? I would find it really interesting to do this with a sample of dietitians or maybe nutritionists and see what the results would be there. Have they learned to overcome this intuition? Would they give me answers like, I'm not going to answer that <laughs> because I, I don't know? And I have not done that. I think that actually is an interesting avenue for future research because that would help me get at the role of experience, but more looking at education. Can education come over, uh, overcome the influence of the intuition. Yes. So the question here is, what if the, the products actually do differ substantially in ingredients? Well, the ingredients are the same, but the price is different. Ah. So yeah, there's a, I said, or if the ingredients are the same, but the price is different. So when the ingredients are the same and the price is different, that's often the reason that is is, is because of branding that you'll see a generic option as identical ingredients um, to a branded option, but people are willing to pay more for the brand. This is kind of more a general consumer behavior question. That's because we buy brands because they say something about who we are. We want to say to ourselves or to others, I buy name brand beans, or I, it sounds silly, but it's actually true, or I identify with the marketing in this, for this particular brand. Think about the brand of car you drive, why you drive it, um, brand of clothes you buy, why you buy them. Branding is the answer to ingredients that are the same, but people are willing to pay more for some brands than the others. In regards to your other question, what about if a product has higher quality ingredients? I would say if you are an aware enough consumer that you're processing carefully enough to recognize that one of the products has higher quality ingredients, you're no longer doing what I would call heuristic processing. You've shifted over, you're doing systematic processing. You're thinking about that much more carefully than sort of the average consumer just throwing things in their cart. And at that point, the intuition actually shouldn't apply. So when we're processing more systematically, more carefully, we're less likely to fall prey to the intuition. So once we start thinking carefully, when we stop and think and we notice, oh, this brand costs more because it has better ingredients, then we're no longer in this sort of heuristic processing mode. This is a good question. Oh, like if it's, he's asking, what if it's like a commodity type ingredient? There you're getting to a pretty sp uh, specific case. I think I might have to actually do some experiments to look and see do people have different perceptions of commodities where it is actually truly the, the same ingredient. Um, I'd have to look at that specifically, I think, to be able to give a good answer to that. Yeah. Other questions? Are we time? OK. One more down here in the front. Oh. What I noticed in the cereal aisle, they took these all of the healthy cereals were what were left over. All of the, <laughs> all of the sugary, everything mm -hmm. was gone. Yeah. The first day. The second day I was out at Chipotle the other day, and I must have not been there in a long time, so they have the calories written on there now. And I actually shop a lot of times by more of the calorie count because that's what's being uh, taught. Because then most people, if you eat a thousand calorie burrito and you only take six 
bucks for it, but you spend twelve dollars on something healthier, you're in the gym longer, you're complaining about it more, <laughs> more often, you know, so that's why you see costs go up. Yeah, so you're actually probably different from most consumers that you're actually using that information on the menu board. But just the, the comment about the children's cereal being left over, that's one where um, branding has a lot of power because there you're looking at advertising to children and the children wanting to identify with, um, my kids aren't old enough to watch a lot of TV yet, but, uh, but the Tony the Tiger and the, the Fruit Loop Toucan, right? It's the kids who are saying, I want that one. And that's also maybe another reason. So that can be a real challenge in the supermarket too. We've got parental yielding to, to kids' requests. So that's another uh, a challenge, I guess, as a parent when you're trying to make healthy choices as well.